We are now going to start Chapter 5, Rigid Body Equilibrium. This is the most important chapter in the book, in my opinion. Uh, this is where it all comes together. What we've done up until now is develop a set of tools that we can be, that we can use to analyze things. And now what we're going to do is use those tools to analyze rigid bodies. Chapter 2, we talked about force vectors, and we, then we concluded with resultants. We did some dot product in terms of finding other components and angles between those vectors. Chapter 3, we talked about point equilibrium, where you were introduced with the free body diagram. Extremely important tool, extremely important skill. And then in chapter four, we talked about rigid bodies and moments, and then we concluded with simplification techniques. In rigid bodies, this is where shape and size and dimensions matter. Uh, in point equilibrium, everything is a, just a point, and so there is no shape to, to, uh, to consider here. Up until now, we've talked about resultants, and a resultant is the sum of the forces equal something, something, sum of the moments equal something. In this chapter, we're going to talk about reactions. And reactions are what keeps something from moving. In other words, we can apply forces to an object, and if it isn't supported in some way, it will be a dynamics problem. It will move. It will rotate, perhaps. And the reactions are what keeps it from rotating or moving. Those reactions are provided by the supports. And we're going to talk about a variety of supports today. All right. So in other words, bodies are subjected to external forces, including their own weight, uh, caused by gravity. They may want to move or rotate the body, and the body is restrained or supported in some way to keep it from moving. Either the ground, a structure, perhaps friction. We'll talk about friction later on. All of these things are called reactions. They counteract the tendency to move or to rotate. Now, Newton's first and second laws are, are printed here for you. They're out of the textbook. What happens here is when bodies touch each other, maybe perhaps we have two bodies or two portions of a body, when they touch each other, whatever happens to one body happens equal and opposite to the other body. In other words, those forces that touch or mate together will transfer equal opposite to the other body. And that's Newton's third law. The mutual forces of action and reaction between two particles are equal, opposite, and collinear. We're going to talk a little bit more about that as we go, but just get used to me in my lecturing and problem solving here is talking about forces transferring equal opposite. Now in equilibrium, we are, uh, we have to satisfy forces and moments, and in that, and the concept of equilibrium suggests that the forces are equal to zero. And in two dimensions, we have three conditions. In other words, we have the sum of the forces equal to zero, some of the forces in the x have to be equal to zero, some of the forces in the y equal to zero, and then some of the moments are going to be equal to zero. In two dimensions, these are the three necessary and sufficient descriptions of our situation for equilibrium. All of our problems start with a real-life scenario. So here's a potential scenario here where this gentleman with a forklift is lifting up these two tubes. What we'll do in our textbook is try to find up or we'll try to define an idealized model and then you the student me, the instructor, will break that model up into free body diagrams. And what we're going to do with those is we're going to recreate this and draw the forces that are acting on these things, separating the bodies that we care about from the environment. In this case, the environment is provided by the bracket here, the, the, the forklift, and the free body diagram takes that forklift out and says what are the forces caused by this thing on these guys. In other words, in order to keep this thing, these tubes from rolling down the hill, you're going to have to provide a force here. In order to keep them from moving in this direction, you have to provide forces here. They are subjected to their own weight as well. So in all cases, what we'll try to do is we'll either start with this and move quickly to this, or the textbook will provide a model and that you'll need to provide the free body diagram. So the free body diagram separates the body from its surroundings. For another free uh, scenario here is that 
this would be the idealized model. It's a ramp here. It's got a string holding it up. The string is mounted there. It may have a mounting condition here. And the free body diagram will separate the thing that we care about the, and will separate it from its environment. So I'm just going to draw that here. This will be the thing that we care about. It will be subjected to some forces. It has that tension. It has its weight. And then it will have a reaction. And we'll talk a little bit more about all of those things as we go forward. So in other words, take the, take the environment, the, um, the things that are supporting it, take it away and substitute those things with just the forces that are, that are causing that. Well, we have several types of forces that, or several types of reactions that we care about in this section. The first one we're going to talk about is a pin. A pin resists forces in both X and Y, but it has no resistant to moment. It's free to rotate. For example, let's take this string right here. You could expect that there's going to be some force in here. If it's done at an angle, there will be a force in the X and the force in the Y. But if you were to try to rotate this string, take away all this stuff, and it rotate the string, there would be no resistance to rotation. So what all of our pins will be, and here's the picture from our textbook. In other words, if you have a pin here, this thing will be free to rotate in this direction. However, it can't go this way, and it can't go this way because it's constrained right there. So what we'll be looking for is pin connections as much as we can. This is a pin connection, a pin connection. This roller is a little bit different. That's uh, something we'll talk about later. But here's a pin connection right here. This one is not a pin connection, and we'll talk about rollers in just uh, the next part, but look for a pin connection. And when you see a pin, you'll see that there is a, uh, you'll see a pin. Uh, that's what it will look like. It'll look like there's a pin right there in the middle of the, uh, of the structure, and you can talk that, or it can, uh, you can know just by inspection that that is a pin. Okay, the next uh, the next support is called a roller, and rollers are free to move in this direction. In other words, they're just like it might say, they're free to move in this direction. So they will resist motion basically only in one direction. Uh, if you were to lift this up, it wouldn't have the ability to pull it back down. But if you were to push on it, it has the ability to push back up. But it has no resistance to motion side to side. So in other words, it will have motion, resistance to motion only in one direction. And also, it uh, it has no resistance to, to moment as well. In other words, if you were to try to twist this, it will have any resistance there. So let's look at... Um, Let's go back and look at the same pictures that we were we were looking at before, and you can see what this one looks like. This is a this is a a roller right here, and the way they've drawn it here in the book is it's got a little rocker, but basically it means that it has no resistance to motion in this direction. If you were to lift it up, it wouldn't have any ability to pull it back down. However, if you're going to push on it, it has the ability to push up, and it only pushes up in one direction. And that direction will be perpendicular to the contact surface. So you can see how the contact surface looks here. And so in this case, the contact surface is flat, so the only resistance to motion will be up. And what we'll call that, that will be the force at B. Over here, let's look at this one. This one's slightly different. We're going to call this one a roller as well, but what we're saying, that's a, that's a pin, but over here is a roller, and here is the contact surface here. So let me go back to this one. Let me just draw the, the, um, the force. The force at B will only go in this direction. Over here, the force at B is going to be perpendicular to that contact surface, which means it's going to go in this direction. So again, we will get used to drawing these things. You will get used to drawing these things. It's extremely important to put them in there properly because that's the only way they'll uh, be able to be solved properly. Okay. Uh, let's uh, zoom back out here and see what else we've got. Um, here's a pin and roller combination. So here is a pin and here's the roller. So in other words, this provides no motion or no uh, support back and forth. The back and forth support will be provided by the pin. It won't allow it to go this way, or this way, or up and down. This is another roller situation. Pin and roller, in other words, the force provided by that roller will go this way. 
Then the last one we're just going to talk about real quickly is frictionless surfaces. Frictionless surfaces act like a roller. For example, let's say that this point has no no n none of these three points have friction and if that's the case the force is going to be perpendicular to the contact surface. So that's the force that keeps it from moving. So I'm going to say that right here there will be a force perpendicular to that contact surface. The same with B. Perpendicular to the contact surface that'll be force A, force B. Now force C is kind of interesting. It is still a frictionless support, frictionless. However, the contact surface is now the bar, not the, not the if you will, the structure around it. So in other words, this bar is being supported with a perpendicular force like that. It's going to be similar to something like this. So we're going to draw the force at C like that, perpendicular to the contact surface. Well, the next kind of support we're going to consider is a fixed support. And fixed supports well, if it's coming out of a wall like this, sticking out like this, we might also refer to that as a, as a cantilever beam. And so these would be cantilever beams as well. If it's coming out of the floor like this, then a cantilever beam doesn't make as much sense. So we'll, in general, consider all of these fixed supports in, uh, in the same kind of category, and we'll call them all fixed supports. Now, what is, what is a fixed support? A fixed support, like all supports, keeps things from moving or helps keeps things from moving. In this case, it is able to resist forces in both the X and Y, and it also resists a moment. So, in other words, it's stiff enough that if you pushed on it, it keeps it from rotating. So, this will resist moment. All of these fixed supports will be resisting of moment. And when we get to that section, uh, I'll obviously draw some free body diagrams and show you how that works. But in general, you should recognize or you should understand that a fixed support resists both forces in X and Y, or forces in both directions, X and Y, and also resists moment. Well, the last thing I want to consider here with you is <clears throat> just to understand how do we go about solving problems using these support uh, scenarios. So what we're going to do in terms of defining our free body diagram is really define our system. We need to properly define the system. The system can be the whole thing or it can be a portion of the thing, whatever the thing is that we're talking about. You isolate it from its surroundings like we were showing just a few seconds ago and then uh, that defines your system. All of your forces can be uh, forces can be external or internal. For example, if this is your structure, this could be your system. It could be a subjected to external forces like this. There also could be um, uh, support forces, which there will be, and these could have external forces as well. However, inside the structure, you can see that there's probably some forces in these trusses. Inside those, inside the structure, those are called internal forces. And for right now, we're not going to consider internal forces. We're going to suggest that we draw the structure, the free body diagram as a whole, and we are not going to consider anything that's going on inside at this time. All right, so draw the free body diagram, isolate the member in question. You identify all external forces acting on it, including the weight, the reactions, and any applied moments. We're going to choose a coordinate system. In other words, generally, there's going to have X and Y. Sometimes, if there's an inclined plane like this, maybe we'll want to define the coordinate system like that. But most of the time, we're just going to stick with X and Y. And then draw the forces in the direction that you think they are going, and we'll talk more about that. Write the equations of equilibrium. We have three equations, some of the forces in the x, some of the forces in the y, and some of the moments. And then we're going to solve for the unknowns. All right, let's move on, and I'll show you some other uh, concepts here. So these are some free body diagram guidelines. I'm not going to go through this whole thing uh, word by word with you, but it is printed in your notes. It is very important that you study this document carefully and understand it. What does it mean? We have to be able to draw free body diagrams accurately and completely. If you don't, it's really difficult or impossible to solve the problems correctly. So in this course, 
uh, the free body diagram is part of the solution. If you draw uh, the free body diagram properly, in general, you don't make as many mistakes uh, using the forces. If you skip the free body diagram, you'll probably will make mistakes. And what I, the way I will grade most everything is that the free body diagram is part of the solution. So in other words, you will not get full credit if you don't draw the free body diagram. So let me just go through here this quickly. Select the appropriate body or body segment. Now we'll talk a little bit more about making selective cuts in chapter 7 and also in chapter 6, but for right now we're going to mostly talk about the entire body as what we're going to be considering. Draw all the forces, all the known forces, and the forces could be the weight, they could be external forces, they could be the reactions which we're going to, which we're going to go through. Draw any unknown forces. Again, these may be these may be applied forces or they could be reactions, but put every force that you can identify on the picture on the free body diagram. Don't include internal forces. And then occasionally multiple free body diagrams must be constructed. The next thing here is the types of reactions that we will be considering in two-dimensional work. Um, again, I'm not going to go through this word by word with you, but what you should do is again look at these guidelines as we go through. Uh, cables are very important and very often uh, used. Uh, this is kind of back to chapter 3 when we had cables and, and they will only be pulling in one direction. You can never push a rope and so the cables will always have only one direction that they'll go in tension, always in tension, and they'll have sines and cosines associated with them. If you have a link, the link could be in tension or compression and that's what this is kind of suggesting here. It could be in tension pulling away from the joint or it could be in compression pushing toward the joint. In both cases it will have sines and cosine components that you'll need to worry about. The next thing would be rollers and rollers, rockers, smooth surfaces and things like that. These are all going to be have the same type of reaction. The roller will have um, will have force perpendicular to the contact surface. So rollers, rockers, and smooth surfaces all have the force perpendicular to the contact surface. They do not allow or do not have any resistance to motion in parallel to the contact surface or parallel. There's no resistance to motion in those directions. And lastly, pins. Uh, and fixed supports are here. Uh, we've already talked a little bit about what those mean and so you should again look at this and try to understand how they work. Fixed supports will have forces in X and Y and they'll also have a resisting moment which is part of the free body diagram. And pins are, uh, are probably the most common. We're going to say pins and rollers are in practically every every uh, picture that we're that we're going to look at. Well, let's go ahead and practice drawing some free body diagrams then. Um, here's the one from chapter 3. We've already done this multiple times, so I don't think we'd have to uh, go through this too much. But this is the way you do it. Make sure that you draw a complete free body diagram with the angles. I don't know what this angle is right off the top. I like to also draw the components. In other words, this would be the a, C, cos, theta. This one is A, B, cos, 30. And then there's going to be a couple of sine components as well. So that really helps if you put the components on the picture. That way I can follow what you're doing pretty easily. All right, how about this uh, pin roller simply supported beam? This is uh, something we kind of have talked a little bit about already. But what we do is we isolate the beam from its environment. In other words, we do not include that pin. We do not include the roller. We only include the effect on those things. So in other words, there will be an AY and an AX. There's an applied force and there's a, an applied moment. This reaction at B, we've already talked a little bit about, but because it is a rocker, it only provides force in one direction. In other words, it can only push up. It can't pull down and it has no ability to resist force in the X direction. So all we have to do is then just draw it in there and we'll call that BY. Over here, 
we have a similar kind of thing. We're again recognizing that this is a pin. This is a roller. Let's go ahead and just draw them in here. I have a free body diagram that looks like this. Obviously it has some applied forces and it's got some reactions. We know that's a pin, so there's going to be an AY and an AX. In this, at this point in time, draw the forces of the reaction forces in their conventional directions. AX going to the right, AY going up. Once we get a little bit better, you can, uh, you can perhaps see what's going on in the picture and it may, you may be able to draw them in a negative way and we'll talk a little bit more about that. This connection at B or the support at B is a frictionless support. And if that's the case, then there is, it is going to be perpendicular to the contact surface, but it will have two components. In other words, this will be, this is B, and this one, whatever this theta is, this will be B cos theta, and this one will be sine theta. Okay, let's, uh, let's keep on moving over here. Let's, uh, let's look at this one with a, with a couple of strings attached to it. Again, isolate the member from its surroundings. So you draw a free body diagram that looks like this. Let's go back to that pin. Notice that we have uh, something hanging off, which is coming straight down. The tension in those strings is always pulling. You can never have a, a string with some with a pushing force. It is always pulling, so there's going to be a tension here and a tension here. Now, we do know something about pulleys, and we know that there is going to, if that tension is there, and because the pulley goes around this, this one is going to have the same tension, so those are going to have components there. When you draw the reaction, or when you try to solve it, there will be a component going in this direction and a component going in that direction, so that's also an important thing to understand. Over here on the left, we have a pin, and so I'm going to say that there's obviously going to be an AY and an AX. Now we have a complete free body diagram that we can begin to analyze. All right, this last one is a uh, frictionless rod that is leaning against the, these two walls. Just something to consider is that because this is frictionless support here, there's going to be a BY. And because there, this one is frictionless over here, there's going to be an AX. And there aren't going to be any AY or BX associated with that because those that's a frictionless support right there. And here at C, we will have contact perpendicular to the contact, the force is perpendicular to the contact surface, but this is now going to have two components. It's going to have a C, Y, and a C, X. And there will be some angle here. Let's see. If this, if this is angle 30, this is going to be angle 30, so this is going to be equal to C cos 30, and this is going to be C sine 30. Anyway, I hope that that's helpful for you. Um, this last one over here I'm going to do as an example problem when we get to that section, so I'm going to stop right there.